Welcome to this presentation on idolatry and interreligious conversation. This particular conversation grows on the basis of an earlier conversation that was convened among Jewish thinkers and scholars titled Idolatry, a Contemporary Jewish Conversation. That was a book that came out in 2023 in Academic Studies Press. That book then served as the basis for a meeting at the American Academy of Religions where we held a panel of multiple religious voices that addressed this Jewish conversation from the perspective of an interreligious conversation. So what I'm about to share with you is my opening presentation at the American Academy of Religion in 2024 in San Antonio. The reason I'm sharing it is because we had some technical difficulties and the recording we made at the time didn't come across properly. Some of the speakers were recorded properly, others were not. My own presentation was not, and therefore I am redoing it now in retrospect in order to introduce this project. So what was the project all about? It actually grows out of yet another book. The book published in 2017 by Paul Grave is called Same God, Other God, Judaism, Hinduism, and the Question of Idolatry. This is a book that I authored, and it focuses on the question of idolatry from a Jewish perspective. The context is as follows. Jews, when they do their own views of other religions, when they do their own theology of religions, pose the question of the validity of other religions. Each religion, when it does theology of religions, poses a different question as the guiding question. For Jews, the guiding question is the validity of other religions. How is such validity measured? One of the criteria by means of which such validity is measured is the criterion of idolatry, or in Hebrew, avodazara, foreign worship. For present purposes, let's assume they are coextensive. There are discussions in rabbinic sources, both concerning Christianity and concerning Hinduism, but primarily concerning Christianity, as to whether Christianity should be considered avodazara, idolatry, or not. In other words, if it's legitimate or not. What I do in this book, Same God, Other God, is to move the discussion from a discussion of whether another religion is idolatry to the question of whether we worship the same God. By redefining the question, in fact, we're shifting the grounds from discussing are they idolatrous to do they recognize the same God as us? And then different strategies may be applied to how to do that. So I make the argument in that book that certainly for Christianity, but also for Hinduism, it is possible to argue that we worship the same God, and hence that it need not be construed as idolatry. And then I enter a discussion of the image of, for, for forms of image and religious imagination, etc., etc. What happens to the category of idolatry once you no longer use it as a means of judging and evaluating other religions? So one possible answer is that idolatry is all about viewing and addressing other religions, and once other religions are no longer considered as idolatrous, as some medieval Jewish authorities consider, the category uh, is put on a shelf. There's not much to do with it. But idolatry is an important religious notion, and it has a, a life other than purely by designating other religions as idolatrous and non-idolatrous. And so I convened this conversation amongst 20 or so Jewish thinkers and asked them, so what does idolatry mean to you if it's not a way of passing judgment on another religion? And that's how this volume, Idolatry, a Contemporary Jewish Conversation, was born. Then we took it a step further and we asked thinkers from other faiths, so what does it mean to you to hear Jews talking about idolatry this way? Is it relevant for you? Now, idolatry to begin with is a primarily a Jewish concern, with Islam also having a stake in it, and Christianity and Hinduism not showing as much interest in the category per se, and yet it is an important category. And so we are having this co theological conversation across four religions on the very category of idolatry, and to what extent the ideas that were offered by Jewish thinkers might be relevant to thinkers of other faiths. This is what we came together to do in San Antonio. So I would now like to share with you my introductory presentation, which is a kind of summary of ideas found both in the Same God Other book, God book and in 
Idolatry, a Contemporary Jewish Conversation book, a summary of ideas that were put forth there, creates a kind of catalog of options of what idolatry might consist of. And when we take that catalog, then we can turn to other religions and see what can speak across religions and how can religions help each other understand God and understand idolatry concomitantly uh, more successfully through this catalog. Let me say in advance that not all faiths addressed the topic in the same way. In other words, or, or I'll put it differently, not all, faith, not, not all respondents thinking on behalf of other faiths had recourse to the entire catalog. So some elements were profiled, some element, elements were not profiled, and really it's still an ongoing conversation to be continued, especially in view of the fairly extensive catalog of options I'm about to present to you. And therefore idolatry, in my opinion, is a topic worth ongoing discussion and consideration in Jewish and in other religious contexts. And this is, I would say, a first stab at an interreligious conversation on idolatry. So with that introduction in place, let me, let me move on to discover, uh, together with you, what might be definitions of idolatry. So the most basic definition of idolatry from a Jewish perspective is the one put forward by Maimonides, Rambam, in which he argues or defines that idolatry is the worship of anything other than God. That makes sense, right? If, I do, if true worship of God is true faith, then idolatry is worship of anything other than God. So, idolatry, the root of the problem of idolatry is the claim for exclusive worship. Some of the thinkers that we've featured in this book have found a similarity between this Maimonidean view and the view of Paul Tillich who refers to idolatry as placing something other than God as one's ultimate concern. So there may be a difference between worship on the one hand and what is one's ultimate concern, but the common denominator is God or something else as the defining feature that frames the religious life. A second notion that's also found in, my, in Maimonides is the notion of idolatry as an error. The, the halachic definition of idolatry as the worship of anything other than God is found at the beginning of the second chapter of the Laws of Idolatry. The first chapter of the Laws of Idolatry is a recounting of the history of idolatry. And what you see there is that the birth of, according to Maimonides, is that the birth of idolatry is an error. People wanted to worship God, they worship in the wrong way, and consequently that led them to the worship of other beings. So the problem with idolatry, why is it a problem, is because it's erroneous worship. You think you worship God, but you're not worshiping God. And relatedly, and potentially, any other error in relation to God or understanding God might also lead us to the same territory of idolatry. So idolatry is error. A third possibility comes at it from a completely different way. Maimonides, Moses ben Nachman, Nachmanides, Moses ben, sorry, Maimonides, Moses ben Maimon, Nachmanides, Moses ben Nachman, a great halachist commentator who lived about, let's say, a century later than, uh, than Maimonides. In his understanding, the issue with idolatry is not wrong understanding. It's wrong bonding. You are what you worship, so to speak. You connect with something. Worship is real. By the contact with worship, you imbibe energy and then you become the thing you imbibe. And that's why witchcraft and the worship of dark forces and negative uh, spiritual connections with powers of evil, that's what the concern of idolatry is. So it's not about right cognition, right understanding, avoidance of error. It's about proper and improper energetic bonding. This is very much a Kabbalistic understanding Nachmanides was an important Kabbalist, Maimonides was an important rationalist, Nachmanides was an important Kabbalist, and within that Kabbalistic understanding you see the focus on energy as the definition. A whole other approach is made by Rabbi Menachem Meiri, a 14th century halachist, who put forward in a completely different criterion, it's a moral criterion. 
He argues, and this is the basis for exempting Christianity, Islam, and in my construct also Hinduism as one way of doing it, from the charge of idolatry. He says, idolatry goes with immorality. This is something we see already in the Bible. And therefore, the definition of contemporary religions is that these are actually religions that are bound by moral ways. They guide society in ethical ways, and therefore they're not idolatrous. We can discuss, and I do discuss, whether it's the ethics per se that defines idolatry, or rather the ethics point to who the God is. In other words, tell me how you behave and what your morality is, and I'll tell you who your God is. And therefore, if you have a proper moral life, that is a sign that you worship the true God. However we may understand it, then, Meiri offers us another very, very important criterion, and that is, if society around you has a religious basis uh, for him, in a notion of a creating and judging, judge, uh, judging and supervising God, in theory, what might think of other ways in which the divine is related to upholding social order morality, then that is no longer idolatry because it avoids the the moral the moral concern. Now, the fifth point I'd like to make touches on the question of avodazara and identity. Avodazara is basically a way of saying. Us versus them. We worship the true God, they worship the false God. Now, it doesn't always operate that way, but historically it very often has. And therefore, the function of Abu Zarah has been to designate and to distinguish Israel, the people of Israel, from its enemies or the alternatives. And therefore, in as much as Abu Zarah does theological work, it also does identity construction. That's something I think that's very, very important to recognize. So the strangeness the strangeness of the other God and the other religion is part of what sets us apart from them. Moving on to the sixth point, I'd like to feature how Avodah Zarah continues to operate internally, morally, spiritually, independently of the view of other religions and how it's continued to operate. And two notions that have their roots in biblical texts, but that continue to operate in mystical and moralistic, pietistic literature, where there are two understandings of Abu Dazar I'd like to share. So these apply primarily to the individual, much less so to the community, but potentially also to the community. So the first understanding is the understanding of idolatry of Abu Dazar as ego, as vanity, as the human person that holds himself to be in higher esteem at the proper expense and appreciation of God. So if you look at Isaiah 2, verse 7 onwards, you have this idea where the human placing of the human person in a certain position really comes at the expense of God, and this then becomes a form of idolatry. So ultimately the root of all idolatry in this understanding is ego, and the biggest enemy is ego. The human ego is the source of idolatry. A second understanding, again with biblical sources, is the understanding of idolatry and money. Money is power. Possession is power. We take power to ourselves by virtue of the fact that we take money, and therefore money is the idol. What are other gods made of? Gold and silver. Well, gold and silver themselves become the idols, whether or not they take the form of an idol or not, they themselves are idols, and therefore our attachment to money is an attachment to something other than God. You can see how these different understandings can combine. In other words, it's not one understanding is exclusive of the other, but, they, but they, they're packed one on top of the other, stacked one on top of the other, so that the understanding of gold and silver become that which is your ultimate concern and that which you worship other than God. Again, going back to biblical sources, is the political understanding of idolatry, and I mark this as, as item number seven. In the ancient Near East, ruler kings were divinities. And the opposition to idolatry is also an opposition to power, any power that detracts from God's power. The rabbis opposed Roman emperor worship for this very reason, because you worship the king, and by worship of the king, you are detracting from the one to whom true worship is due, namely God. And this ends up translating into political power. 
and the risk that political power, when applied out of context and disproportionately, is itself a form of idolatry. This 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 impacts Jewish political theory, the history of the view of Israeli, in other words, ancient Israeli kingship and more. Another point that emerges, particularly in the discussions in idolatry of contemporary Jewish conversation, has to do with the notion of fixity. It grows out of an analysis of the idol, and the idol is something that is stationary. It does not move, has no dynamism. So idolatry, in the view of some of our authors, is that which is fixed. It doesn't adapt to times. It doesn't take account of circumstances. It's frozen. The notion of God may be frozen, but other notions come into it as well. The notion of Torah may be frozen. Other notions of things that are important that lose the ability to have spiritual dynamism and vitality associated with the presence of God and then instead become frozen in the sense of fixity. And here we move to the ninth point because we see how the notion of idolatry actually moves from God to other religious ideals. At its core, idolatry is about God, proper and improper approach to and worship of God. But the notion of idolatry can then be extended to other ideals. So the religious system is like an, uh, an economy where different elements come together and they create their balance. What happens when that balance is lost? And certain things become too central and they take over the place of the entire system. So some people may think that the place that the land of Israel in contemporary uh, forms of Zionism, religious Zionism, has become an idol because it's taken away from the broad, broader system. Others may think that Torah study and Torah itself has become an idol. Uh, there's this expression going back to Yosel Rakover, or something that Emmanuel Levinas spoke about, loving the Torah more than God. So when the Torah takes on a place that's more significant than God himself, that can itself become an idolatry within the religious system, even if not, even if you still maintain worship of God, but something else has taken that centrality even within those religious ideals. So when we look at this catalog of options, I'd like to suggest that this catalog can be boiled down to two fundamental perspectives. One is cognitive and one is relational. Cognitive, in other words, something to do with our understanding, where the problem in idolatry is a wrong religious understanding. The wrong religious understanding may relate to God, uh, but it also applies to other values that are seen in a way that's improper, out of balance, disproportionate, an expression of fixity, etc. The alternative perspective is relational. The problem with, the, with idolatry is it undermines or up, upsets the appropriate balance or approach to God. The error is not the issue. The issue is that somehow the relationship with God is now got out of hand and, and isn't in its proper place. I think this question itself is very interesting as we, as we consider idolatry across religions. In other words, what matters to other religions more? Is it the relationship or is it the proper cognitive understanding? And then which of the different elements in the catalog I've just shared with you would be more problematic for which religion. So I think here we, there's great there's room for great and very enriching conversations. I'd like to ask one concluding question, and that is, do we assume that idolatry is the same then and now? In other words, when we go back to biblical and rabbinic materials and their battles against idolatry, do we continue to perpetuate those battles? Do we assume something else has taken place? I think this is at the root of our project. This is why... We start with the notion of a contemporary Jewish conversation. What is contemporary? What do, we, what do we think of today, the question might be. And if we think about it that way, then are we simply perpetuating old notions of idolatry, which some might consider itself to be a form of conceptual idolatry, or are we looking for new ways, fresh ways, to restate a category that has in it the potential for being a vital source of religious rejuvenation? Because if we know what idolatry is, then we keep our faith alive, fresh, in perspective and in balance. So these are the questions that a group of Jewish scholars has thought through. These are the questions that we have brought to an interreligious group of thinkers in San Antonio. And we will be sharing uh, perspectives of the different faiths in the coming issues and coming releases of YouTube videos. On behalf of Elijah Interfaith Institute, 
I am Alun Goshen Gotstein. Thank you.